Nations require huge amounts of money to fulfill their basic obligations and to remain viable for the future with infrastructure and economic and social programs. In many countries, including developing countries, taxes alone are not sufficient for this. So these nations take out loans on the international capital markets and award interest-bearing securities, also known as government bonds. States and companies that take out loans are called issuers. This is where the rating agencies come into play. In their role as auditor of the creditworthiness of companies, financial products, and governments, they have substantial influence on international capital flows. This is particularly problematic in relation to nations. Since the start of the financial crisis in 2007, rating agencies have been continuously under fire and are starting to be scrutinized more closely and even regulated. Credit rating agencies were created during the railroad construction era. Railway companies needed loans to pay for workers and material. Investors sought opportunities to invest their money profitably, but did not know which entrepreneurs would be able to repay the loans with interest. Rating agencies were created to assess the creditworthiness of companies. The result of these evaluations were then sold to investors in the form of credit ratings. The ratings reflect the probability of whether borrowers will be able to repay their debts. AAA is the highest rating, and if nothing implausible happens, a company or country with this rating will be able to reimburse the lender. D is the lowest rating, and means that a payment default has already occurred. The ratings determine how much interest an issuer has to pay. The better the rating, the lower the interest rates. The services of the rating agencies were originally paid by investors who wanted to know where they could invest their money securely. Meanwhile, in order to even be considered by many investors, bond issuers pay for the rating agency assessment. The first conflict of interest arises here. The entity being evaluated pays the evaluator, which could affect the objectivity of the rating. A further conflict of interest arises from the fact that rating agencies also assess so-called complex financial products. These financial products are packages consisting of various base values and derivatives, which are often packaged together to bring high-risk loans to the market. They are initially created by the rating agencies in collaboration with their clients and are then usually rated by the same agency. In other words, the rating agencies evaluate their own product. This also threatens the objectivity of the credit ratings. For instance, critical evaluations have been suppressed in order to please the client. Other rating agencies have often simply been overwhelmed by the evaluation itself. This is one of the most frequently cited reasons for the financial crisis, with sugar-coated ratings misleading international investors. Currently, there are only three key global rating agencies, Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch. These big three share 90% of the global rating business. Moreover, major shares of these companies belong to the same large investors, so there is virtually no competition. In many countries, certain reactions to credit ratings are prescribed by law. For example, if the credit worthiness of a country or a company slips below a certain threshold in the opinion of the rating agencies, then the investment is considered speculative, and in many countries investors are forced to sell the affected bonds. As early as the 1970s, borrowers in the U.S. were even obligated to show credit ratings from nationally recognized agencies. Furthermore, ratings are legally considered opinions, so that rating agencies cannot be sued or otherwise made liable for negligent or even false ratings. This leads to the fact that rating agencies currently have no reason to fear the consequences of errors or negligence. What's more, there's no supranational surveillance that can review the work of rating agencies. Another problem is that even if all the ratings were issued with the greatest possible objectivity, there remain vague forecasts that cannot possibly allow for every conceivable factor. Unpredictable developments and crises always occur. The situation is aggravated by the fact that the narrow economic horizon of the agencies is poorly suited to assess the future of an entire country. Often, their forecasts lag behind the current development. This leads to the fact that rating agencies frequently upgrade or downgrade countries and companies too strongly, promoting what is known as pro-cyclicality. Here's an example. Suppose that many investors lend a country huge sums of money. 
the country's in an upswing, the ratings improve, and more money flows into the country. A little later, the situation returns to normal, but the rating is maintained. Only when a minor crisis affects the country is its rating abruptly lowered. This turns a minor crisis into a major one, because suddenly debts are collected while the barriers and interest rates for new loans also rise. Developing countries are partially financed by government bonds on the international capital markets. The proportion of these bonds compared to traditional development aid is continually increasing. To gain easier access to these loans, countries require a rating. The quality of the ratings they receive, however, is often inadequate. As their culture, language, and legal system is more difficult for the rating agency staff to understand than in Western-oriented countries. Fewer rating analysts are employed in these departments as compared to those for industrial nations. This frequently results in superficial and sweepingly negative ratings. This raises the question as to whether it's actually good for a developing country to have a credit rating. For even if it is more difficult to issue bonds without a rating, the payable interest is actually less for no rating than for a poor rating. A national rating can also have serious consequences on the companies of the country, as the rating of a company is practically capped by the rating of the country in which it is located. The credit ratings are heavily influenced by pro-business and neoliberal views of the world. This means that countries can improve their credit rating if they conform to these world views. In this way, rating agencies exert direct and indirect influence on nations. Government spending, social measures, and other projects serving sustainability might be neglected in favor of a misconceived notion of economic development. This ultimately means that nations that do not promote the welfare of their population, but rather the welfare of their business elite, frequently receive better ratings than emerging democracies with social development programs. Even a parliamentary election could be considered by agencies as an instability, resulting in a lower credit rating. The first question that needs to be asked is whether states should ever run up debts on the capital markets. For then they are always subjected to the judgment of the rating agencies and are forced to satisfy the profit interests of investors, ultimately through taxes. Instead of using fixed interest bonds, they could obtain resources under more favorable and stable conditions through direct financing with taxes and fees. In this way, they would remain independent from the influence of rating agencies. As long as nations are evaluated by private companies, states should reconsider their approach to the rating agencies. The rating agencies themselves should be reformed in several ways. The agencies must be monitored and work more transparently. In terms of supervision, the interests of developing countries must be given special attention. The power of the three major agencies should be restricted, including a ban on expansion. There should be an increased number of alternative agencies, including a public or at least a non-profit agency. It should be possible to make rating agencies liable for grossly unrealistic ratings, because these are often caused by negligence, conflict of interest, or simple greed for profit. Laws that require responses by investors based solely on credit ratings must be changed. Investors need to once again evaluate the risks themselves. The external rating should be seen as additional information, not as the sole basis for decisions. Nations are evaluated on a range of criteria, primarily on the core economic factors such as the gross domestic product per capita and economic growth. However, ratings should not merely assess the pro-business stance of a country, but also the sustainability of its development. The welfare of the population and the environment should be included as evaluation criteria.